From the Watson Institute at Brown University, this is Trending Globally. I'm Sarah Baldwin. Will Collier and Aidan Riley were as shocked as anyone when they were sent home in March to finish their semesters remotely. But the shock quickly turned into action. They were struck by two seemingly unrelated crises they saw in the news. Massive lines at food banks and shattered supply chains that left farmers with food they couldn't sell. Will and Aidan had an idea. Maybe they could deliver food from farmers directly to the people who need it most. Will, Aiden, and a few friends started renting trucks and driving food from farms all over the country straight to food banks in Southern California. We looked up the laws online. I was 21 years old at the time. Can I drive a semi-truck? And I can. <laughs> and so we picked up 10,800 eggs and we drove it to Westside Food Bank in Los Angeles. They call their organization FarmLink. And to date, they've delivered 10 million pounds of unsold food to people in need. This week, we're continuing our series on how Brown students are navigating the pandemic. I talked with Will and Aiden about their plans for growing FarmLink and about the underlying issues in our food system that FarmLink is addressing. But first, we talked about how they came up with the idea. Here's Aiden. I had read a New York Times article about farmers due to supply chain breakdowns, essentially, you know, the farms that like supply brown their food in universities all around the country and chain restaurants, these major commercial farms are having to bury huge amounts of produce, stuff, a perishable produce that they had promised and then the order was canceled. It was cheaper for them to bury that food. At the same time, I had some connections with uh, food banks in Los Angeles that I had volunteered at in high school. And I basically had heard that they were burning through their their supply i mean they had you know some some had from their usual 300 people that would come to their food bank a week now they had a thousand people who were coming looking for meals and that was due to a litany of reasons i mean largely unemployment rates skyrocketing at the beginning of this um pandemic so we just decided i i I had the thought with my friend james knoff that we could try to connect one of these farms that have surplus food to food banks in la we thought let's you know we don't know anything about trucking We don't know anything about farms and we don't even know that much about food banks, but let's just see if this is something we could do to help. And we kind of spitballed that idea around a little bit and and figured out how we could do it. And I ended up talking to Will one day. Will and I were thinking about doing a project together, you know, how can we keep ourselves busy? And I mentioned this and he was like, oh my God, like me and my brother Ben, I've been thinking about this same exact thing and how we could fix this problem. So I said, all right. Uh, sweet. We're, we're looking right now at a farm in Idaho from this New York Times article that is bearing millions of pounds of onions. You want to figure out how we can try to get this to uh, this food bank in Los Angeles? And thus, uh, we did that delivery and the rest is kind of history. Well, I, I need you to break that down for me. Do you call a farmer on his phone? Yes. we. Re- how do you get his phone number? Early on, we, we looked in the, so we, we had the name, we had the names from the New York Times article and all the other articles that were publishing this similar issue. And Google is a wonderful resource. Google is a wonderful resource. <laughs> so those first couple weeks, honestly, uh, was just us sitting and having very uh, awkward phone calls with farmers saying, we hear about this potential issue. Can you describe it? And we want to help out food banks. If you guys have surplus, what's the best way for us to be able to get that down? And what do you need? So an example, that first delivery was with that farmer, Shea Myers in Oregon. He said, yes, I'm burying them. It's breaking my heart to bury all this produce. What I would need though, is I still need to be able to pay my truckers and the person who's picking and the people who are picking and packing this produce. So we said, what is that price? And he said, it's about a thousand dollars. So we raised a thousand dollars by basically reaching out to friends and family. And then he sent his truck down from Oregon and we had cold called, did similar thing, cold called food banks around Southern California, found the ones that needed a truckload of onions that could use it, that, that distributed that amount of food. And then we, we coordinated with them. They said, yeah, we can take it on this day. And we said, okay, we'll get it to you on that day. Um, and we basically figured throughout that first process that it really wasn't that complicated maybe to make these connections. It was something that just took us cold calling and learning as much as we could and then working together as a middleman between food banks and, and these farmers. So we figured this is something we, this is repeatable. Did I read somewhere that you also rented a truck yourselves and drove eggs? Yep, that was Aiden and, uh, and a couple other guys in Los Angeles the, the day after our, our first onion transport, actually. Yeah, we found, we found a farm that had surplus eggs. They had specifically eggs 
you know, we made it, we made it, we made it clear pretty early on that we were going to provide economic relief for some of these farmers. We were going to uh, pay at cost or market so that, you know, sometimes it's cheaper for them to just bury their produce. We found this, we found the egg farm and we said we can buy this, these eggs and it's, and we can get it to this food bank, but they didn't have a truck like the onion farmer. So we were like, what do we do? What do we do? We looked up the laws online and we were like, can we transport it ourselves? And my, I'm 21, I was 21 years old at the time. Can I, can I drive a semi truck? And I can. (laughs) And so we, we, yeah, we picked up, we, we went, went to the truck from Penske, drove to the farm, picked up, I think the first one was 10,800 eggs and we drove it to Westside Food Bank in Los Angeles. And we've done that several times now. We, we have not been, yeah, just, just yesterday we had a farmling team member, Owen, Owen Dubeck, go pick up eggs. He rented a truck from Penske and picked up uh, 64,800. Yeah, 64,800 eggs. And he brought it to Watts Empowerment Center in Watts, California. And that, that was an amazing thing to see. So we're still doing that process largely. Can you describe the phone calls with the the food banks when they learn, like, are they do they believe you? And the farmers, are they emotional? Are they mightily relieved? Are they are they sad? It's been uh, a spectrum of, of reactions because when we first started, we were five or 10 college students. We had barely had a name. We didn't, uh, we hadn't done anything before. And so when uh, these farmers start to ask like, well, who have you worked with before? You know, how, how, how can I trust this? Um, it's hard to give any sort of credentials that would be legitimate. And so uh, the whole thing is building blocks, basically, you know, starting with a couple transports, using those to leverage a couple more transports, using those to build up your base, build up your base. And uh, through media coverage, as well as uh, working with uh, a, a large handful of farms across the country, we finally got to a point where uh, people know our name a little bit. People see the impact that we've had so far. And so we've actually had farms start to reach out to us. We've had uh, groups reach out. Um, Borden Dairy was one, was one of them. They're one of the largest dairy manufacturers in the country. And they um, they actually got one of the USDA grants to uh, to send a bunch of their dairy around the country. And so they saw us on the news and reached out and said, hey, can you help us transport all this? Can you help us find these food banks, make these connections and, and get this dairy out? Um, so that was that was one big thing that came from uh, having this more recognizable name. But um, one thing that we have seen is across the board, farmers, um, like anyone that that puts work into something, produces anything, they're devastated to see that they have to plow their their crops back under. They're devastated to see that this this effort, this time, this commitment that they've made to produce food that uh, it feeds all of us. It feeds everyone in America. Um, that food to then have to go back into the ground is is something that breaks their hearts. And so uh, this process has been great because uh, we're not just helping them with money, but also this actual relief of getting the food off of the farm and to people uh, that need it is something that they've been incredibly responsive to. Um, and the food banks as well, they they they're always uh, grateful to have this extra produce coming in. I mean, it's not just food, but it's nutritious, healthy, uh, nutrient-dense food that is is great for the community as well. Yeah, I, mean, I would say at the beginning, our, our success rate in regards to calling farms and food banks was around 1%. I mean, we got hung up on so many yeah. times. Uh, people think, you know, we were just trying to emphasize like, no, we're students. We're not making any money off this. I promise you. We just want to make the connection. We just want to help out and then just beep, hang up. Uh, Cause you know, we got accused of being scammers and, and, yeah. and all sorts of doing it for profit. Now it's much easier because we can at least point someone to our website where we have media links that give us some sort of, that give us legitimacy and show proof of what we've done so far. But the beginning was a lot, a lot of calls and, and a lot and getting hung up on a lot. I think for even for the first onion shipment that we did, uh, I think uh, Aiden, James, uh, a few others called maybe a hundred different farms before we even got that one first first delivery. So it it was something where uh, to get it off the ground, it, it definitely took a lot of uh, uh, resilience and sort of just realizing eventually we will get a hit. You know, eventually there will be a bite. So. Yeah, and well, I'm glad someone took a chance. And now, and so you went from, were you a handful of students kind of dispersed across the country? 
Yeah, it was myself and James Knopf and then Will and his brother Ben at the beginning and Max Goldman, who also goes to Brown. And so it was really the five of us for maybe the first couple of weeks. And as we started to have progress, we posted things on our socials, asking people to donate, for example, or, or help us out in some way. At the beginning, it was friends saying, that's really cool what you're doing. Can yeah. I help? And then it was so it was, then it was 30 people. And then those people started posting about uh, our, our progress that we're making with FarmLink. Fast forward to now, we have, uh, you know, in the Slack, which is what we work on, we have 180 people from, and not just students anymore. We have engineers and, and, and laser scientists, we have a laser scientist, <laughs> uh, GIS mappers. G- yeah. We have researchers, ex- like experts in their fields from all across the country who, who have extra time right now and want to help. Oh, so they're volunteering their expertise in ways that you need. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so one of the biggest things in turn or the biggest growth moments was, uh, like Aiden said, we were growing organically. We would bring friends on, we would, uh, bring on people that reached out to us, but eventually it got to this point where we were getting thousands of people commenting, uh, direct messaging, emailing, saying, how can I help? How can we help? We have trucks here. We have uh, people that want to go to deliveries here um, all over the country. And so it got to a point where we were probably about 50, 60, 70 people in the Slack. And we realized we had so many people that wanted to join. And it was just, it was a little disorganized. Um, if you're just bringing people on uh, at, at will, there's very little barrier to entry. There's there's very little uh, oversight as to who's coming on where. And it's just pieces getting plugged in all over the place. So we actually ended up uh, at the beginning of the summer, we, we, we stopped that organic growth and we said, we need to start doing this in a more uh, systematic approach. And so we actually, realizing that internships were being canceled, people had free times over the summer, we put out an application on LinkedIn, we put out an application uh, at, on a couple of Brown websites, Stanford websites, you know, different schools that we had uh, had kids come on and, and start from. And so two and a half weeks ago, we brought on 80 new members at once, uh, this vol- new volunteer class for the summer that they didn't have internships and we had a major application process for. Um, and so we've been working at a very high capacity for the last few weeks and bringing on uh, new members, training new people in, in what we do. It's been incredible because from the beginning, I, I've studied architecture. I studied economics at, at, at Brown. So I, I did those. Aiden does political science. My brother does applied math. You know, none of us came in with this background in supply chain logistics, in agriculture, in, in anything uh, that is directly the core of what we do. But it's been the most incredible learning process throughout this entire thing. And so I uh, now we are the ones bringing people in and and teaching the ways of what we've been doing and uh that growth in only what 12 13 weeks of being around it has been uh one of the most valuable sort of learning experiences and lessons i think for me and i'm sure for these other guys too that we've ever been a part of just tell me what you're looking for in volunteers what kind of people do you want to sign on to farmlink's mission Given that we're given that we are students and we came with no experience, we don't have an extraordinarily high bar set. And in, in sense, what we're looking for are people that are excited and passionate about helping and willing to offer whatever they've learned in school or in their job, and are just willing to apply themselves. Those are the best types of people that we've taken on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a fluid learning process. You learn as you go, just as we did. And and so we're really just looking for a passion and enthusiasm. I'm wondering, um, especially for Aiden. You know, what are your plans for next year? And, and are you, do you, do the two of you plan to continue with FarmLink? Yeah. Well, all of us sort of made a pact at the beginning of the summer saying, okay, this is now bigger than we thought it was going to be. And with the amount of people we have working on this and the amount of resources we've uh, collected, we now have a responsibility to not just help people during the pandemic specific situation, but we can help food waste and food insecurity in the future, something that's not unique to the pandemic. So we're staying on for as long as it takes to get this thing to become something that s- continues to help people for not just the rest of the year, but for 10 years or 20 years or later. That's our goal. And as long as that takes, I mean, we're going we're gonna to be here. That's awesome. I, I was going to ask you, is there a future for FarmLink after this crisis moment? And it sounds like you believe there is. In a normal year, um, across the globe, we produce enough food to feed everyone on, on this planet. But each year, 30 to 40% of all food goes to waste. Um, and that is 
there are so many different points along the supply chain. You start at farms, processing plants, uh, retail and grocery. Finally, you get it to consumers. It goes bad in consumer hands. You know, it, across the entire line, there's there's food waste. But um, if we can step in and, and through what we've developed during this, this uh, crisis relief time, through this opportunistic start, uh, create a more systematic approach to getting in touch with this food waste and redirecting it or creating another system, um, we think that ultimately we could have a massive impact uh, for, for years to come. Were the two of you interested in um, hunger, food insecurity before this uh, pandemic? interested i would say and aware of the issues but not even remote we have learned so much since we started it is such a bigger issue than we knew and it is being exacerbated every day during these remarkable circumstances this has changed i think the course of each of our lives in regards to what it is we prioritize and what it is our awareness of the issues going on around the country specifically in food insecurity what are some of the most surprising things that you learned I think, as Will said, that we grow enough food around the world to feed everybody, plus an additional 2 billion people. And the fact that in the United States alone, 40 percent of produce it goes to waste at the same time, uh, according to Feeding America projection in the next two years, one in every two children is going to be food insecure. In America. In America. In the United States. Which basically means they, they, are, they won't know when their next meal is going to come and when, when it's going to be. And... Those those statistics are hard to wrap your head around, but it, it's just it's just I think anybody can hear those and just see that there's just a blatant disconnect. And I think the the pandemic has really highlighted structural inefficiencies and and and, and kind of uh, kinks in the system for in, in, a, in a plethora of areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and this is a very very poignant one. Yeah. So that's how why we feel. I think I mean we're devoting ten, eleven, twelve hours a day about six days a week uh, working on this and there's tons of us doing this and that is what drives us. I mean, it's a, it, it, there, there's few things that we can think of in our own personal lives that can take precedent over working on an issue like this. So that's been rewarding in a sense, but also it's a lot of responsibility and it's, and it's overwhelming, but we take it one step at a time because that's the only way we can do it. Yeah. It sounds like one of those issues that once you have the epiphany, you can't walk away from. Mm -hmm. It is exactly that. It's been something where we started and we jumped in immediately. I mean, these these long days, these this this focus on this issue started mid-April and each week it's like, okay, you know, last week was crazy busy. Last week we got so much done. We uh, we worked hours and hours, you know, maybe this next week it'll, it'll let up a little bit. And, you know, I think we, I, I, I say that over the weekend, I'm like, you know, you know, maybe this week it'll be a little less hectic, but the nature of, uh, us learning so much and jumping into this, this space and disrupting in a way that, that we never really imagined. Um, I think the, the passion and the drive that everyone on the project shares. And that's why of the 180 people, everyone is a volunteer no one has paid anything. 100% of all donations to FarmLink go towards the uh, relief for the farmers, helping the truck drivers, getting this food to give to the food banks. You know, uh, the nature of it being this passion project and this this focused um, effort on everyone's part has made it so fast paced and and so incredible. And that is almost the beauty of it too. How uh, immersed. I have felt and how immersed all of us have felt in the project where um, you don't even realize that that you're 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 spending all day on it. You know, it's something where you look up and hours have passed and you've just been thinking or or, or in a meeting or doing something that, that is that is towards this project. And it's like during the school year during the pandemic, you know, this was something where, uh, yes, the remote classes are uh you know, you have to learn, you have to finish out the semester, you have to do okay on finals. But this was really an outlet, I think, for for myself and for a lot of us where um, it was something we actually were motivated to get up in the morning and do and we wanted to be doing. And so it's been a privilege to be able to work on the project as well, for sure. I'm going to ask you to simplify because I know it's a really complex answer. But When you think about real change at a policy level, at a behavioral level, what is preventing this world from feeding itself? 
To be honest, I think that there are a lot of underlying economic factors of the food realm that that we have learned about and still probably don't understand fully. Um, but as as we've worked with farms, I think certain things we've realized are um, if we save a certain amount of surplus lettuce, right? And we inject a million extra pounds of surplus lettuce into this market where people can be going to food banks, going to um, different locations and just getting this lettuce for free instead of going to the store and getting their lettuce, right? How does that change the price of lettuce, the value of lettuce? How does that change for these farmers where now instead of them uh, selling their normal lettuce a million pounds for $2 a pound or whatever it is, and that's just an arbitrary number, I came up with that, but um, does that lower their price and ultimately make this, this discrepancy sort of fall on the farmers now? Um, and so one thing that we've had to think about, and this isn't a consideration right now as we're in this, this, this early stage, but if we were to move forward and be, uh, trying to allow the world to fully, uh, use and take advantage of all of the produce that we create, is there a way to set up secondary markets or different uh, different ways to still be allowing these farmers and producers to be extracting the value from these products instead of uh, if we're just injecting free food or free uh, free commodities into any system, it's going to change the the unit price and the unit economics of the entire system. So ultimately, I think when you think about change, there's a lot of uh, – sort of qualitative factors and the way you interact with people, how you get it to uh, a point where it needs to change. But behind the scenes, I think this massive economic model is something that is a big reason why there has been little change in recent I don't know, years, decades, yeah. et cetera. There has not been enough incentive for secondary markets to come in. For example, us to come in and buy that surplus and then redirect it to who needs it. So what's happening is these gigantic distributors that are producing huge amounts of produce uh, their best option is to pay a landfill to take it and pay the regulation fees uh, in California, for example. And that's expensive for them. So there really is a major gap between uh, what's available to them and the secondary market options that may be cheaper and redirect that surplus to better areas. So that's one specific uh, place in which we could see a structural change that would allow for less waste in the United States. I'm just thinking you've you've lived through spring and you're living through summer. How will farm links work change in the colder months? Yeah, so well, for one, there's the there's the the question of of harvest and uh, on the farm level, what type of produce will be available and the amounts that will be available. And that's something that we're going to be we're we've structured our organizations where we're, you know, we're fluid and flexible for taking types of produce and amounts all over the US and then finding who needs that exact amount. In regards to internally, I mean, we're, we're very lucky right now to have the amount of people that are volunteering full time and, and working together on this project. That being said, people will go back to school and people will go back to their jobs. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we set up a system that is benefiting from the amount of volunteer, the, the volunteer force we have right now, but also is not dependent on that. So essentially, if we lose let's say half of the people working full time on this right now, as people go back to uh, school or their jobs or whatever it may be, that's okay. We've set up a structure where this thing can operate with fewer. And, it, and, 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 and that, that's our goal. That's what we're working on every day mm -hmm. for the last several weeks is setting up that, that structure. When you prepare food now or get takeout, when you eat now, do you, do you think about food differently? Yes, and I, I think a pretty... <laughs> Pointing an example of that is it's actually not just Will and myself quarantining here in Idaho. It's the other seven people who are pretty much the team leads in FarmLink. So the ones who are 100% all in have committed their summers and beyond to making this thing happen. So we're all making dinner together and eating together every night. And at the end of the night, I mean, it was like last night we, we made some, some pad meal, thai, pad yeah. thai, whatever. And we, there was extra and God forbid we go and throw that extra in the <laughs> trash. I mean, there, we, uh, we, there is a, a very increased hyper awareness to waste, how our, the nation produces it and then how we produce it on an individual level. Cause that's mm -hmm. the best way to see. And I think something that we've realized throughout, uh, this entire initiative is, 
Um, and we started at the beginning, we were like, we are a grassroots movement. We want to uh, affect and work with as many people as possible. You know, this is something that is not just us, but we want to inspire change across the country, across the world, you know? And so um, one thing that has been uh, really important to us is not just moving or acquiring and and, and uh, helping these farmers acquiring this food and getting into food banks, but being a, a platform for awareness and and spreading ideas about food waste and 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 talking about food waste through social media, through impact articles we write, through even uh, news talking about farm like it's trying to keep this massive these two massive crises, food waste and food insecurity, in the forefront of media to allow for there to be more of a, uh, a nationwide and global uh, attack on on the issues, you know, to get everyone involved, not just be a quiet force doing it in the background. We want this to be something that is in the forefront of people's minds, that is ultimately uh, going to change because people will it to do so. Well, Aiden and Will, it's been fascinating talking to you uh, and also very inspiring. And I wish you tons of good luck and um, you should probably get back to work now. Thank Thank you. you. Appreciate it. This episode was produced by Dan Richards and Jackson Cantrell. Our theme music is by Henry Bloomfield. I'm Sarah Baldwin. You can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like the show, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps others find us. For more information about this and other shows, go to watson.brown.edu. Thanks for listening, and tune in in two weeks for another episode of Trending Globally.